Hey everybody and welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you all checking it out. Today we're going to do a COVID-19 update video. We have not done one of these in quite a bit of time, um, but cases are up a little bit and we're going into the fall and winter seasons here. So we wanted to uh, provide an update on kind of case counts, geographic distribution, variants circulating, wastewater management data, all that good stuff. In addition to that, we've been seeing a lot of news articles talking about this XEC uh, variant. And people are somewhat predicting that it might end up being kind of the variant that takes hold next. So we're going to do a, a dive into the XEC variant. We're going to talk about what it is, uh, what two variants it is a product of, symptoms, transmission, whether the vaccine pre uh, protects against it, if it has higher, you know, morbidity, mortality, those types of things. So no further ado, quick 30 second break for introduction. Don't go anywhere. We'll dive right in. Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. All right, thanks for sticking around. So starting with our COVID-19 update. So this here is a map uh, of the United States for those unfamiliar. And we wanted to start with this um, because case counts are up in some places. Um, and case counts in September have gone up in general. We're starting to see kind of a decrease back down, which we'll talk about. Um, but case counts have been up uh, in this late summer period. Um, as you can see here, the yellow color is cases up 10 to 15%. Orange is greater than 20%. I should say dark orange, light orange is 15 to 20%. This kind of teal and light green are, correct me in the comments what these colors actually are, but these greenish colors are all low percentages. What you can see, there's actually no states, at least in the US, that have these low percentages. So all of them are anywhere from 10 to 20%. Um, the map here, the percentage showing is test positivity. Obviously, this is only going to um, equate to the tests that are positive and reported, um, as well as um, implying that you have to be tested and that test to be positive. So it's not, you know, actual case counts or those types of things. This is just simply percent of tests done that are reported to be positive as compared to total tests being done. Um, and again, we can see that all states are kind of 10 to 20% test positivity. Um, the biggest areas that y'all can see are kind of here in the central U.S., right? We have some in the south here. So the central U.S. is greater than 20%. Uh, test positivity. You can see down in the south um, surrounding Texas, we have kind of the 15 to 19 percent test positivity. Up in the northeast, same thing, 15 to 19 percent. And everywhere else is this kind of 10 to 15 percent. So everywhere has at least a 10 percent test positivity um, with some kind of central areas that are seeing more positive tests. When we look at the actual numbers here, these are the actual numbers. So in general, on average, at least in the United States, the test positivity in this past week was 15% on average. So 15% of all tests done and reported were positive for COVID-19. It is down a little bit from the prior week, so down 1.6%. Um, the past two weeks, it's averaged 16.6%. So, you know, this kind of August to September period, we had increase in case counts, um, down a little bit, but still quite high, right? That means, you know, almost every one in five tests for COVID being done is positive. And we've seen this in our clinical practice as well uh, over the last month or so. We've actually been seeing uh, more cases of COVID-19 diagnosed. And, you know, anecdotally, this is probably just because more people are getting COVID, but we've seen a couple of patients get really sick and have to be admitted to uh, our intensive care unit um, with COVID-19 pneumonia in their lungs. And all those patients had other comorbidities. You know, they were old, they had different medical conditions, putting them at particular risk. Um, so they weren't, you know, young, healthy folks like in that first initial wave. Um, but nonetheless, we have been seeing people get a little more sick from COVID-19 than, than when case counts were low. Um, uh, we're not at all suggesting that's an implication that new variants are causing more severe disease. Uh, rather, it's just probably because there's more COVID going around and thus um, we're going to see more patients that do get sick from it because those with comorbidities um, who are at risk um, can still get pretty sick from COVID. All right, if we go down to the wastewater data. So what this is, the COVID-19 wastewater data. All right, viral activity level. And they what they literally do, and we've covered this before for those who've been following the channel for a minute, what they literally do is they test the wastewater for viral particles, right? For SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes 
COVID-19, and they test wastewater, sewage, for SARS-CoV-2. And the reason this is effective is because all the people in an area contribute to that wastewater, right? It's all their waste. So this isn't reporting tests, um, which implies that you need to do tests and then report those tests. This is just everybody living their life contributing to the sewage. Um, and in addition to that, it often will give us results more quickly. Uh, and let me explain that a little bit more quickly than testing because you usually don't go get tested until you start feeling really sick, right? Um, and then that test is positive. Whereas wastewater, once you have the virus and you start shedding that virus in your bowels and it goes into your stool and you um, uh, poop it out into the wastewater, uh, obviously that is when that virus is going to be detected in the wastewater. So it doesn't require you to kind of progress to severe symptoms for a couple of days and then go get tested and all that good stuff. Um, and the reason I think this is interesting is because the date's down here. So what we put on here was February 2023 through September 2024. All right. And what we saw, I just kind of want people to look to the this side. Um, what we saw was this steep increase in the viral activity in the wastewater um, just until you know a little bit ago. This is July, August, September. So August we kind of saw this peak here. And now what we see is a little bit of a downtrend, which obviously is good. But what I wanted to point out now was this last year, right? So this is September 2023 here. Um, so it's one year ago. And what we saw last year also was this kind of peak. Right, right around August, September, and then it started to go down. But what we then saw come probably around October was a huge increase for the winter months, right? And that was the highest uh, amount of COVID that we saw between December 2023, probably into like February or so 2024 was this huge peak. So hopefully we won't see that, but this graph's kind of following a similar trend, right? As here, went up in September started to come down and then kind of took off. So I wonder if what we're going to see is this peak, it'll start to come down and it'll take off again. We'll have to see kind of what this high point is as winter progresses. Um, so wastewater data um, is something that we think is, is a good thing to track, um, dependable and gives us a lot of good information. And we'll be kind of keeping our eye about this area here to see if this is a true decrease and it's going to kind of just keep going down if we're going to see this decrease and then increase like we did last year. Okay, so talking about the variants circulating right now, um, these are current variants in the USA specifically, um, and we'll kind of get into some global stuff after this, uh, but we wanted to kind of point to the dates, right? So this is August 17th, 2024, all right? And this is kind of the predicted scale up to September 14th, 2024, all right? And what we can see here is the majority of predicted cases by um, this time in September is this KP311, right? This one here. And it's of the Omicron lineage, KP311. And KP311 started to grow a little bit back in July. And you can see that every kind of check since July, it's represented more and more of this pi. And it's anticipated to keep representing more and more until it does become the majority. Um, most people think it's going to kind of um, take over as the strong majority as these other uh, variants shrink, right? So this KP-3, uh, this kind of pink one here, was the slight majority earlier this year, back in June of 2024, right? And you can see as the years went on, or the months went on, um, it represented about the same amount. It didn't really start shrinking in its percent until July. And it was, oop, our battery is low. And the KP3 didn't really start shrinking, this right, this pink variant didn't really start shrinking until this August uh, area when KP311, the blue really started to take off. So these are all Omicron lineages. The nice thing is, um, as it's spreading, uh, it doesn't seem to be causing more severe disease or things like that. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to kind of keep track of this, especially when below we start talking about this XEC uh, variant and how that might start to take over. But KP311 for the foreseeable future seems to be the, the subvariant that is growing and it does seem to be causing more severe disease or those types of things, but it's certainly very contagious uh, as we've seen with a lot of these variants, right? Because variants self-select for the most contagious ones because those are the ones that are going to replicate most, right? When you infect a person as a virus, you replicate in that person. And what is beneficial to that virus is that they get into more people. So it kind of selects, right? It self-selects for more highly transmissible variants. 
It doesn't self-select for variants that cause more severe illness, unless it also coincidentally is more highly tr transmissible, but it does select for more transmissible variants. So as COVID spreads and these variants start to spread, and there's certainly lots of other variables, but the more transmissible mutations, the things that affect that spike protein, which is kind of that outer protein on the virus, if we were to draw the virus as a circle here, inside the virus is its genetic code, and then on the outside of the virus, are these proteins and these proteins are the spike proteins or the S proteins and they connect to the human cells and help the virus infect those cells. And these spike proteins are often what are mutating, uh, which are leading to the more transmissibility of the virus. And we'll talk about that again a little bit more when we talk about XEX or sorry, XEC. All right, so now going into some of the interesting stuff, this new variant that's gone kind of viral in the news, XEC. So what's really interesting about this new variant is that it's actually a recombination. It's a recombinant Omicron variant. And we've talked about this in the past. It was the distant past, but it was when this idea of Delta Cron started to kind of be talked about, which was when there was a Delta variant that combined with an Omicron variant and someone creative came up with the catchy name of Delta Cron. Um, and that was to describe this recombinant. So what a recombinant variant is, is it's when two different variants combine their genome. Right? Usually what happens is, pretend these are all viruses, right? Usually what happens is you have a variant, this is its genetic material. And as that variant continues to infect people and replicate, as it's replicating, it makes little errors, right? So maybe part of that genome changes there. And as it continues to replicate, you know, it makes uh, additional errors. So you have this error that continues, but maybe there's a second error now. And as these become different, they become different variants. But what happens in a recombination event is that two separate variants with two different genomes, say one is a green genome and one is a purple genome, both infect the same person or animal at the same time. And as these two viruses replicate inside that person, Sometimes their genomic material gets mixed together when they're replicating and gets kind of combined to a degree. Um, it's not like you add both of them together, but different pieces of each genome get mixed together into a single one, a single recombinant genome. And that's what happened with XEC. So it's this KP33 and this KS11. If we scroll back up, to the variants that have been circulating, right? If we go down, a lot of the KPs are what are um, highly transmissible right now. Um, and you can see you get KP, we thought we saw it up here earlier, maybe we lied. Um, actually, we don't see it up there. Um, but you can see some KP, we don't see the 3, 3, and you can see some KS as well. Um, both of them are from Omicron lineages. Um, but these two recombined, both infected the same person or human, animal, who knows, and they recombine into a new recombinant variant called XEC. And this variant has been spreading. It was first identified actually in Berlin in August of 2024, but Italy was a little delayed in submitting some of their viral sequences. So later on, we realized it actually was first seen in Italy in May of 2024. Um, so it's only been around for a couple of months. Right? And since that time, it's now, it's probably more than this at this point, but in at least 27 countries, uh, France is seeing some cases, Germany, the UK, the USA. And in the USA, it's in kind of half of states. Half of the states in the US have now detected cases. Some of the big states are New Jersey, California, Virginia. Oh boy, did we forget the abbreviation for Virginia VA? That's right. Um, these three states are three of the states that kind of have seen more cases than the rest. We've seen about half of states in the USA. So people are thinking it is a more contagious, more transmissible variant. And some are predicting that it's going to overtake this KP311, uh, which is the one that's dominating right now. And the reason people are thinking it's more transmissible, just for those interested, is that it kind of got a different mutation from the KP33 variant and the KS11 variant. And both those mutations are mutations that help spread the virus on the spike protein. One is called the Q493E, which is representative of an amino acid in the spike protein. The other is T22N, again, representative of a, a mutation within an amino acid in the spike protein. Um, and each one of these mutations, right, this mutation, 
helped KP33 be more transmissible, and this mutation helped KS11 be more transmissible. So this new recombinant has both the Q493E as well as the T22N mutation in its spike proteins, um, which people are um, surmising or hypothesizing that's going to lead it to be more transmissible and infectious. So the question always becomes, well, do we care? Is it cause different symptoms, more severe symptoms, people get sicker, something like that? And the answer is um, that it seems to not cause any more severe disease than preceding variants. Certainly we don't know that for sure, right? There's no way to know for sure, but the transmission does seem to be increased uh, based on those mutations and some modeling that's been done, uh, which is why we think it probably will become the dominant variant circulating this winter. You know, we've seen cases double in different countries. You know, the UK cases of XCC doubled. Uh, we've seen it spread obviously into half of the states in the US. But the symptoms seem to be about the same as the other variants. These are kind of those common cold symptoms. Congestion of the nose, fatigue, fevers. You can get cough, sore throat. Um, some people get GI symptoms like abdominal discomfort, nausea, diarrhea. Um, so the symptoms seem to be the same as previous variants, which are kind of these, we're going to write common cold symptoms and are hard to differentiate from other things like the flu or influenza or um, different uh, respiratory viruses in general. So these generic common cold symptoms seem to be the same and it doesn't seem to cause um, any increased severity, right? Now, again, we mentioned we've seen some patients sicker in the intensive care unit over the past weeks who have had COVID-19. Uh, no way to know what variant they had, and it most likely is just because there's more COVID circulating. Uh, but I think it's just another testament for folks that might be a little older or have a lot of medical conditions or have lung conditions or they're immunocompromised, you still can get very sick. You know, we've had patients on ventilators uh, who have been very sick up in the intensive care unit the past few weeks um, because of their COVID-19. So certainly keep an eye on yourself. Um, the other thing that was uh, discussed which we didn't write on here was vaccines for those interested. The vaccines out do seem to cover the XEC because the two variants XEC was recombined from, KP33 and KS11, um, are variants that do seem to have coverage by uh, the vaccines out there. So again, if you're interested in that, it does seem like vaccines will cover uh, XEC and, and help decrease your risk there. All right, hopefully that was interesting or helpful or created some degree of uh, educational value. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Uh, subscribe, hit the bell button. We're going to be trying to come out with at least one kind of medical news education uh, video per week and then a couple other denser medical education topics too. So we'd love to have you in the whiteboard medicine community. Um, either way, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.